New Zealand recession bells are tolling. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, a paper's just come out from BNZ in New Zealand to say that the chances of the New Zealand economy moving into recession are rising by the day. New Zealand's economic imbalances continue to be exposed at a time when the global economy is increasingly coming under duress. The policy measures taken to fix those issues are getting more and more aggressive, and the chance of a soft landing is fading. They went on to say the fundamental issue we face is that the economy has suffered a series of massive supply shocks. Domestically, the biggest impact has been felt by the labour market. Those suffering with COVID and or isolating have left businesses short-staffed and needing to employ swathes of temporary staff. This is costly and eventually shows up in selling prices. As if that wasn't bad enough, closed borders imposed an additional constraint on the supply of labour. And don't forget labour was already in short supply pre-COVID. Consequently, not only have businesses been forced to take on more labour to cover shortages, but they've also had to compete via rising salaries for the diminished pool of labour, which remains available to draw on. The labour market has thus provided a general inflationary pulse to the economy. But labour supply constraints have not been limited in New Zealand. Many of the same issues are being faced across the planet, meaning the cost of imported goods is also rising. And in New Zealand's case, the freezing of international supply chains has further reduced the capacity for the economy to produce goods and inflated prices as an auction market for goods in short supply develops. And if that wasn't all terrible enough, the Russians decide to invade Ukraine and the Chinese decided to impose one of the most severe lockdowns seen on the planet. The former added to supply chain issues and resulted in massive upward pressures on energy prices, food fertilizer and other base metal costs, amongst other things. The latter simply dropped demand further. And to cap it off more recently, the New Zealand dollar has fallen sharply, pushing up tradable goods prices even further. And yet while supply was polaxed, a combination of government support, ultra-low interest rates, effective COVID containment policies, and the remarkably resilient New Zealand uh, have kept demand far loftier than any of us would have imagined, they said. The result of all this is that demand is exceeding supply. The unemployment rate has plummeted to levels that are seen as being well and truly inconsistent with maximum sustainable employment, and CPI inflation has climbed to 30-year highs. That this disequilibrium can be solved, a process will have to be found that trues up supply with demand. It's difficult to see a quick resolution to supply-side constraints. The government can help at the margin with appropriate labour market settings to encourage folk into the workforce and provide flexibility for employers, and businesses alike. And it can also do its bit to facilitate the hiring of offshore labour where and when deemed appropriate. The right COVID settings can also help ease some pressure points. This is all well and good, but it's hard to see how any of this can dent the excess demand for labour sufficiently to put the labour market back into balance. This means the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is faced with doing the majority of the heavy lifting. But with inflation and the employment rate so far from their respective targets and supply unlikely to lift markedly in the near term, the only available option is to crush demand to meet the new levels of supply. And from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's perspective, this means getting CPI inflation down from an expected annual peak of around 7% in the June quarter of 2022 back to near 2% and seeing the unemployment rate rise from its current low of 3.2% to something in the order of 4.5%. Realistically, there can be only three ways that this can play out. First, there could be a sudden positive supply response, both domestically and internationally. Or second, the economy goes through a relatively protracted period of low growth. Or thirdly, the economy goes into recession. They said we accept that supply conditions will start to improve. Already fewer people are isolating because of COVID. Border controls are being reduced and global supply chains are starting to ease. But there is a very long way to go. And their central forecast currently is that New Zealand's growth stalls completely in 2023. The danger is that the wheels well and truly fall off. Kickstarting the softening, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has already begun what they expect to be an extensive tightening cycle. The New Zealand cash rate so far has been hiked by 125 basis points, taking it from 0.25% to 
but they say we are less than halfway through the process. We are expecting a further 50 basis point rise at the May 25th monetary policy statement, followed by a series of rate increases until such time that the cash rate reaches somewhere between 3% and 3.5%. This will represent the steepest increase in the cash rate since the Reserve Bank began inflation targeting, and its magnitude will come close to matching the Bollard era tightening cycle, which ultimately ended in the 2008-2009 recession, albeit that it wasn't just interest rates that generated that recession. Many associate the 2008-09 recession with the global financial crisis, but actually New Zealand was headed well into its downturn before the term GFC had passed anyone's lips. In the words of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the international financial crisis actually played little role in the early part of New Zealand's economic recession. Rather, it was drought, falling house prices, and high petrol prices that dragged New Zealand GDP growth negative over the first three quarters of 2008. And then, of course, there was the hike in interest rates. There's not much talk of drought at the moment, but the truth is much of the country is being impacted by severe water shortages. And ironically, some of the country that is not in shortfall is being hampered by too much water, such as Gisborne and parts of the Hawke's Bay. In general, there is strong evidence that agricultural production has been adversely impacted by weather conditions and there is a growing fear that there is more bad news to come, especially given the possibility of La Nina hanging around for a while longer. What we do have, though, is falling house prices, and that is most definitely going to get worse. The REINZ stratified house price index is already down 4.2% from its peak, and the consensus view is that prices will eventually correct between 10 and 15%. The risk, though, is that they will go even further than this. In 2008, the peak to trough for house prices was 10.9%. Falling house prices constrain household spending via the wealth effect. Spending on big ticket and discretionary items normally take the biggest hit. This is at a time when increasing spending by New Zealanders offshore will also constrain domestic spending. Of course, it's not just house prices that are under pressure. Equities are in retreat too. The NZX50 has now declined a cumulative 90% from its peak. And then there's petrol prices. So far, pump prices have risen 45% over the past 12 months. Without the government's excise tax cut, the increase would be more like 55%. And back in 2008, the peak in petrol price inflation was around 30%, although prices had risen by a similar amount two years prior. And also familiar is the role the corporate sector plays in driving economic outcomes. One of the most useful indicators of this is corporate profit expectations. According to the NZIER, a net 33% of QSBO survey respondents said they would expect profits to fall. And when profits are falling, businesses cut investment spending and consider reducing staff. Current profit expectations are currently very much consistent with an impending recession. And guess what? In March 2008, the QSBO profit reading was exactly the same number. To cap off the domestic data, consumer confidence has plummeted and is now consistent with an economy going backwards. And some of those factors above are being directly impacted by developments offshore. Alas, more generally, the offshore situation will also continue to weigh heavily on New Zealand. So broadly speaking, offshore demand growth is likely to start softening, international supply shocks will remain prevalent, and rising offshore interest rates will influence New Zealand rates. The specific regional issues are obvious. The Russia-Ukraine situation will have implications for many years to come, and Chinese demand will be suppressed for some time, whether or not COVID restrictions are maintained in their current form. What will be less obvious to some is that most of the developed world is now in the midst of what appears to be a synchronised tightening cycle. When this happens, it inevitably leads to a, a contemporaneous slowing of the economic cycle. The consensus view is that global growth is indeed moderating and that it will ease back further. When any slowdown does become synchronised, we tend to underestimate the feedback loops that occur between trading partners, which usually means growth ends being up lower than anticipated. New Zealand is highly leveraged to global growth, so this will weigh on our future prospects and in particular has negative implications for our commodity prices. This may well already be showing up in the declines being given in the global dairy trade auctions. And in terms of synchronicity, asset markets are already correcting. Both equity and bond prices are in retreat. 
So whichever way you look at it, the planets are aligning in such a way that a recession seems difficult to avoid. And I have to agree, I think that is the consequence and the conclusion that we should draw from this too. And as I've said on other occasions, I think New Zealand is perhaps six months ahead of Australia in terms of dealing with these issues. And therefore, we're going to see the same sort of thing play out here in Australia in the weeks and months ahead. I think a recession is on the cards. And deflation is on the cards. That will, of course, translate to lower levels of debt. And as the debt spiral decreases rather than increases, that'll pull home prices down further still. This is going to get precarious. And the question is, at what point do central banks reverse course again, cut rates, and maybe even take rates negative? That's still certainly something which I consider highly probable, just not yet. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.